again or not? <laughs> One thing about it, if I do, I'll write my words big enough for you to see them. <laughs> Amen. All right. Second Corinthians chapter 12. And uh, I'll start reading at the first verse. Verses 1 through 10. That's not too much. Just 10 verses. But the apostle said, It is not expedient for me, doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body... I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for man to utter. Of such an one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. <laughs> For my strength is made perfect in weakness. But my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in, in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Thank you for standing for the reading of the word today. When I'm weak, then I am strong. Come on. Strength through weakness. Come on. Strength through weakness. We look at this remarkable page of Paul's autobiography. Things that he wrote about himself. He didn't write a whole lot about himself. He mostly wrote other experiences, doctrinal things to the church. But here we talk, we're finally talking some about himself. Paul belonged to a great army of believers Come on. who had their hearts pierced, pierced with the darts of many, many sorrows. Come on. Yet he continued to to do his work for God. Uh -huh. He never stopped. He never Come faltered. On. He never failed. Come Regardless on. of what hit him, uh -huh. he kept going. Yeah. I'm telling you, there's been times that I haven't done so well. Come but on. I'm wow. sure that if we could call back all about Paul's life, there were times of recuperation for him too. Absolutely. Come on. That's right. There were times whenever he had to stop and regroup, uh -huh. regain on. some strength, and then keep going on for God. Right. Hallelujah. Don't you imagine that there were times when there were great crowds coming by to hear him, and then there were times when there were just only a few. Right. Yeah. I read where uh, 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 he said that people said about him that his words were bold when he wrote a letter but then he wasn't that good of a preacher whenever he come to him. And so, so Paul had all these things to deal with. And uh, yet, yet, uh, 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 he talked about this thorn in the flesh. Uh -huh. Now the reason of the thorn, we can already see that uh, he didn't want to mention his own name. He didn't want to pat his own self on the back. So he knew a man once, told about himself. Right. That for whatever reason he was caught up into the third heaven, 
into paradise and he heard some things that wasn't even lawful for man to utter. And there's been a lot of uh, uh, things said about that. Was he caught up in the ecstasy of prayer or I'm telling you, I'm just giving you my opinion. Come on. For whatever it's worth, he was stoned. I believe that. Come he on. was left for dead. Right, yeah. yes. They thought he was dead, and he could have been, but yet, in the meantime, God chose to let him just rise right up out of the rock pile. Come on. And do you yes. think that while they had the life just about beat out of him, Woo. amen, that God just let him see some heavenly things? Yes. Right. He that. said later, he said, it's better for you if I stay, but uh -huh. it's better for me if I go. Yeah, right. After oh, he'd yeah. seen all those heavenly things, Brother Tom, amen, he just could not get them out of his mind. Right. I'm going to tell you, just as soon as the sooner we get on our faces right. and seek the face of God to where we can see heavenly things, right. the more we'll have difficulty of getting these things out of our mind. The more we see of God, the less we're going to see of ourselves. That's right. Now, uh, I don't know what this thorn in the flesh was Paul mentioned. I don't. Uh, I'd like to hurry and preach, but just bear with me. I, I don't know what it was. Uh, I, I was teaching Sunday school class over the old building several years ago. And I said, I don't know what the thorn in the flesh was. I mentioned several things that that uh, I've read that men felt like it poss possibly was, but uh, somebody spoke up and said the Bible was plain with it. And then he talked around for four or five minutes there, talked himself into a circle, and I didn't understand what he meant. Nobody else did, and I doubt if he did. <laughs> Amen. Because the Bible's not clear on what that thorn in the flesh was, but whatever it was, it was more than just sticking your finger with a briar and having a piece of, uh, of the briar left in your finger. It was something that was so serious that it caused him great distress. Right, yes. Amen. Hallelujah. And yet he wanted to continue on doing for God. He wanted God to take it out. Right. He wanted God to remove it. Yeah. Because it was something, obviously, that he could not take care of for himself. Right. Amen. And he contributed it to be a messenger of Satan. From Satan, yet God allowed it to take place. Mm -hmm. We look at something like that in our life, and I wonder how many of us run and pout. Come on. And say, but God, you should have moved it. You should have moved it. And I've got situations going on now, and you do too, some of you, that you would pray that God would move. Come on. And yet, for whatever reason, he still hasn't moved yet. Amen. This thorn in the flesh that's continuously disturbing our peace and disturbing our mind. Come on. Amen. Hallelujah. But Paul looked at the thorn, and it was hindering his work. It was something that took down the proud flesh that he could have had. Stop thinking about it. I know I'm going to avoid it today. But who Paul was. He gave his pedigree, if you will. He gave his who he was. He was a tribe of Benjamin, and, and I'm telling you, a whole big list of stuff down through there. <laughs> when he got to talking about the end of it, that was nothing. Yeah. That was nothing. He counted Christ more than it all. Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. It kept down spiritual exaltation. I've looked around, and I've seen men that's a whole lot younger than I am, and, and it appears that for a while they run high, and then this, they got a tremendous ministry, and then after a while it, it just fizzles away, and it's not the will of God that we fizzle away, and I realize God can take us from one place and put us in another. He's never chose to do that to me either. I just uh, continue to stay right here. And God could put us one place and, put us, uh, and, and, and take us from one place and put us in another. But yet we see ministries after ministries just fizzling away. Uh -huh. Why does that take place? I'm talking about men who, who preach camp meetings and, 
and, and, and have great, great ministries, and then all of a sudden you never hear of them anymore. Right. It's because they get so exalted in their flesh that people can see through it. Uh -huh. I was at a church probably <coughs> it's been about 35 years ago, maybe, maybe 36, 37 years ago. I was in the church, and I walked in and sat down by the pastor. And uh, he he was an older man. He had a walking stick in, in, in between his legs and when he was sitting there. And he bounced it on the floor at some time of frustration. And he was in revival with a preacher there. And the preacher was a pastor. And he called him and said, I feel like coming for revival. And he told me, he said, he will come Monday through Friday, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday and Friday, and said then he won't come Wednesday because he's going to go back to his church. And then he won't come Friday and Saturday because he's got to go back to his church. And so he wants to come here and hold a revival. He said and help this church and then him just come four weeks, or four days out of the week, four nights. Mm -hmm. And so when the preacher got up, the evangelist got up to preach or pastor evangelist, got up to preach, he was bothered. He was bothered because there weren't too many there that night. And I've said, I've used this illustration before, but bear with me. I'm talking about getting exalted in the flesh. He was bothered because there wasn't too many there. And he said, I don't understand this. He said just a few years ago, he said this building would be running over with right. people to come and say, come and hear this man preach and sing. Yeah. And when he said that, I knew immediately what his problem was. Uh -huh. He had got lifted up in his own pride of his preaching and his singing, right. and he couldn't get past him, and nobody else could either. Right, right. Right. Help me preach You're here right. just a few okay. minutes today. Now, Paul didn't want to get to that elevated in the flesh. Uh-huh. And so God, God didn't want Paul getting that elevated in the flesh. No. And he put that thorn in his flesh to keep that elevation from happening. Yes. Amen. How many times have we looked around and we've seen sheer talent, I mean some of the best you could ever see in your life. Amen. And God really moving in their lives. And then whenever they looked around and I'm making it on my talent, then after a while, it's gone too. Yeah. That's right. Let me preach. That's right. Hallelujah. Amen. But Paul took refuge in prayer. That's what he did. He took refuge in prayer. And he was able to accept this thorn in the flesh reluctantly, but without protest. Right. Hallelujah. There's things that I go through and you go through reluctantly, but God help us to go through these things without protest. <coughs> To remember that God has placed these things in our life, amen, and, and allowed these things to be in our life, amen, and they're just more obstacles that we've got to overcome, we've got to endure, we've got to make it all the way through. Right, yes. Hallelujah. 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 Paul, like Christ, had to learn to accept some things of life. Who else but Jesus? In the Garden of Gethsemane, with his hour just about to come upon him, he just kept reminding his disciples prior to this, this hour is coming, this hour is coming on me, it's coming. Well, he was just about there, and he was in that garden, and he was praying. And, and, and I don't want to go down a rabbit trail, but the rest of the disciples were asleep. Yeah. Somebody had to hear that. Somebody had to record it. And most of the uh, writers that I read about, read you know, up on these things, feel like it was John Mark, just a young boy. Uh, who was that boy that they pulled that total uh, uh, cover away from him and he ran away naked? He's not mentioned. Amen. But no doubt it was John Mark there and heard that, heard that prayer yes. when Jesus prayed, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. Right. Hallelujah. Amen. If it just be in your will, anywhere in your plan, Lord, 
could you let it pass from me? Yes. Amen. But it was the will of God for him to go through that weakest moment. Amen. That he could be the most powerful God in the universe today. Yes, sir. Woo. Hallelujah. Come on. Come on. We yes. go through those weak moments. We go through these weak, weak times. Amen. Oh, God, would you help me here just a few minutes? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When we pray, we need to be real when we pray. Yes. Amen. We need to let God be real to us when we pray. Right. Hallelujah. God. God didn't take away the burden from Paul. He just simply said, my grace is sufficient. Right. Yeah. Rather than remove the burden, God was going to say, say to him, I'm giving you Strength to sustain you through this burden. Right. That grace was strength to sustain him in that burden. Yes. Hallelujah. I'm not preaching something that you don't know. Amen. But that strength, that sustain is the power to come from down under and lift us up. That's our faith. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, God, how can this be? I'm going through the time of my life, but yet God says that it can be done. Yes. They're going out here, and multitudes is following Jesus. A crowd of 5,000. Amen. That's the 5,000 men. We've talked about this numerous times. But Scripture said 5,000. We're just leaving it at 5,000. But that's 5,000 men. That's not counting the women and children. Multitude of people there. Amen. And then Jesus brought up the remark uh, 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 about them being fed. And I believe it was Philip said, Lord, 200 penny worth. Wouldn't feed this crowd. Yeah. Now I looked up 200 penny worth, and the best of my knowledge, what I found out, that it was about 200 days wages. Now that's about little over six and a half months worth of work for the, just a the regular man out there. A denarii, denarii, ever how you pronounce that, was a day's wages. And uh, so he said, uh, 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 It'd take a man six months, Lord, working, and take all of his pay to be able to feed this crowd. Hallelujah. But Jesus just asked what they have among them and found a boy with two fishes, wouldn't it, and five loaves of bread. Amen. And he took that and he blessed it. Amen. And, and, and passed it out. And multitude was fed there that day. Unto him that hath it shall be given. Yes, we've got yes. something to go on today, yes. but we've got to trust God for the rest of it all the way through. Yes. Well, I'd like to preach if I could. Hallelujah, Jesus. Help us come here. Help so he us fed them that day, and then with nothing. Yes. He fed them, and it was a great crisis that they had run into. Yes. And when you stop to think about it, when we're going through it, and most of us do, Yes. The wider we open our mouths, yes. the more we're going to receive. But if you've done like I've done in the past times, when we start going through it, that's when we clam up. Oh, God. We don't feel like praying. Oh, God, I can't pray. I've been there. I'm not making fun of you. I've been there. And if you will, I'm... I could still be going through more things than you know about. And Lord, I sure don't feel like worshiping and singing. I don't feel like doing anything but what I'm going through. But I've found the wider I open my mouth, the more I receive from the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. The quicker I get an answer to my prayer, the quicker I get an answer to the need that I've got before him, or if I don't get the answer I'm looking for, at least I get the strength to sustain me while I'm going through it. Yeah. Right. Well, hallelujah. Right. I guess this ain't no shouting message, but it's what I feel like to us today. Amen. God's strength works in our weaknesses. First, we've got to realize that we're weak. Right, yes. Before you ever get saved, you've got to realize you're a sinner. Now, I don't like this term, I'm a sinner saved by grace. I was a sinner, but now I've been saved by grace. 
I'm going to tell you, after we've been saved by grace, if we get so high that we think we cannot get back down and do something to displease God and even outright sin, right. you are badly mistaken. Right. Amen. You are badly mistaken. Yeah, right. You are terribly mistaken. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We've got to realize we're weak. Next, we've got to have that faith that God is going to supply the strength. Now, when we got attacked, and something attacked us, the enemy allowed it to attack us. He, he did it. God just backs up and allows him to, God allows him to do what he's doing. He don't stop him from it. The first thing we start thinking about is that's me. I'm me. Somebody done this to me. Somebody done this and that and the other, and this happened to me. And God, you know who I am, and why did this happen to me? We start feeling real bad about it. Real bad about it. Amen. And we lose our faith that God is going to supply us the strength to bring us out of it. Psalm 119, 67, the psalmist said, Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I have kept thy word. Went on down in verse 71 in the same psalm and it said, It was good for me that I have been afflicted, and that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. Yes. Right while we're going through the trial of our life is when God teaches us really who he is if we allow him to have complete control of our everyday life. Come on. Right. My back is so much better. Sister Esther talked me into going to chiropractor last week. I had never been to one. And I'm telling you, it was the burning sensation up here just a little, almost between my shoulders, had been there ever since I fell here in the floor off of them scaffolds while we were working here, while they were working here, and I was just in your gum and round, and, and, and fell down there. My back has been in a bad shape ever since. I couldn't get any relief. And uh, when I think I was getting a little better, then I'd do a little something and get worse. And so I go in and and, uh, and the chiropractor has me lay down on this thing. It's like a small water bed. And, uh, and it gets warm and it just shakes you all over. And I'm laying there flat on my back, and I think I am going to die. They don't come up here and get me off this thing. I can't take no more of it. And finally, I put my elbows down under me and raised myself up a little bit to relieve the pain and took my left leg and come up like that. And I sat there, and I'm still in pain, laid there, but I just about went to sleep. And then whenever the lady come in and got me up from there, and he took me in and laid me down on another thing, and... Instead of laying me down on my back, I'm in my belly, the way I've seen him do her, uh, uh, and, and pop my back, uh, he didn't do that. And I laid down on my belly for him to run his finger down and see where the problem was. When he saw where the problem was, he says, now turn over. And when I turn over, amen, then he puts his fist down under my back, and he gets me over the shoulder, and he shoved me down on that. The pain was excruciating. I'm surprised they didn't hear me all the way downtown. Amen. And then he does the other side that way. But I get up and I get to feeling better. Amen. I've been feeling better ever since. I'm telling you, sometimes we go through things, and when we do, and God brings us all the way through it, we realize that we're better in the long run. Yeah. Are you helping me preach? Come on. Hallelujah. Psalm 129, 2 said, Many a time they've afflicted me from my youth, yet they have not prevailed against me. They've not got the upper hand. And I think sometimes we sing those songs. We don't sing it much here, but I've heard it sung. Fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting in my soul. And I don't know how the rest of it goes. That's all I have in my mind. But before that cup could ever be filled, it's got to be empty. Yeah. Right. Before
before God ever feels it, it's got to be empty. Are you helping me here? Come on. No, we don't want it empty. Not God's way. I've protested many, many times, Lord. Why this? Why this? Why that? Why is this going on? Why is that going on? And yet it still goes on. And in the meantime, I'm being emptied before God can ever feel me. And I'm preaching like this today because the Lord has laid this on my heart and many of us are not as filled as we think we are. Come on. I spoke in tongues. I still speak in tongues. That's a great thing. Sometimes God is so merciful to allow us to speak in tongues. When we were seeking for it, some of the things that people get into today has got the Holy Ghost. You'd have never got it as long as you was doing them things and you know it. Come on. But yet God through his mercy will still allow us after we've received the baptism to allow people to still go ahead and speak in other tongues and then not really. But what he's doing is through his mercy, he's allowed them to come back and get closer, closer, closer. And after a while, they'll stop. He'll just simply stop. It won't do it anymore. And then you'll find yourself full of the world and empty with God. But when we're full of the Holy Ghost as they were on the day of Pentecost and as those first seven deacons were that were looked out to become deacons of the church those men were full of the Holy Ghost. Oh yes, Hallelujah. They had nothing but the Holy Ghost yes. in their life. That's all they wanted mm -hmm. was God. And great miracles was wrought from their hands. Today we want money we want jobs. Young folks want marriage, and there's nothing wrong with the money, jobs, and marriage. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with it. It's when we put money, jobs, and marriage ahead of God. Oh, yeah. That's when the problem comes. That's right. That's right. And when we put money in our marriage and our jobs ahead of God's work, after we become older Christians, God's still not satisfied with it. We become full of that. And we're not full of God. And where the power of God's not working in us regularly. I'm trying to close. I hope I'm not talk in circles this morning. But I was working on the job. And I'm a supervisor. And the old fellow's dead now. But I almost remembered his first name. I can see his face as plain as day is the first name was Arthur Arthur and uh, he had a blood clot passed through his lung that's what they determined it was and he just blacked out mm -hmm. fell on the floor mm -hmm. and he blacked out so you heard me tell this before and everybody started gathering around him and I got everybody back I said let, let the man get some breath let him breathe and, uh, but he was aware of what was going around, on around him. He said, told me later, he said, I was aware of everything that was going on around me. I just simply took the spot. And I got the ambulance there. Got him, got him out of there. And a few weeks later, he got strength back to back to work. And the first thing he did when he come in that plant has got me off to myself and he said Sid your church going man you are a praying man and he said I was that close to death and I was waiting to hear you pray for me and you never I was full of a job. I was full of the crisis at the moment. Come on. 
And I failed to call on the man who could calm the storm. Right. That's right. Yes. After that, I didn't care who came to me. I didn't care who had a problem. I didn't care if the company liked it or if they didn't. They come to me and they wanted prayer. I laid hands on them and prayed for them. Oh, I had enemies. You always have those. I had people who tried to find fault with me every way they could until I walked away from that place, and they still do it. That's a thorn in my flesh that I don't like. But he'll not go away, neither will the chief. But God's talking to us today. You're going to go through these things. You're going to have to endure them. And when you do, you become weak and realize, I can't make it by my own self, Lord, and I've got to have you to carry me all the way through this. <coughs> understand today, a big crowd of us, and it's early yet. We really need to pray. We really need to pray. Talk to the Lord about these crises that you're going through. And he knows that you can't handle it. But you've got to learn that you can't handle it. I've got to learn that I can't handle it. God's the one takes care of it. All the way through. Come this morning.